Welcome to Rough Drafts, how God writes his love in our stories, a podcast that explores the faith journeys of our friends and neighbors in Burns, Tennessee. Everyone has a story to tell. And in this podcast, we'll hear powerful and inspiring stories of how God works in the ordinary lives of people like you and me. Our stories are unfinished and perfectly imperfect. They are just rough drafts, a glimpse of what is to come because God is still at work, writing plot twists, introducing new characters, and bringing good even from the most challenging circumstances. Join us as we see what God is up to in our stories. Here's your host, Matthew Hyatt. Thanks for joining us today, friends. Today's episode of Rough Drafts is going to be a little bit different. I don't know that I've put a content warning on one of these before, uh, but if you've got kids listening today, um, there's nothing we're going to talk about that is inappropriate um, or anything like that, but we are going to talk about some deep stuff. There may be some terms that your kids have some questions about, uh, so I just would encourage you maybe to listen to this one all the way through before you listen to it with your kids. And now that I've said that, you're really interested to find out what we're going to talk about today. (laughs) I should put this in front of the most boring episode that we're going to record. Today's guest is a counselor of 17 years. He has worked with Ultimate Escape. It's a pretty cool ministry that deals particularly with uh, sexual abuse and trauma issues. Um, He has done a lot in the world. You have already heard from his mother-in-law on this podcast. So I don't know if that's a good introduction or a bad one. Depends on on who you ask. Today you get to hear uh, from the dad of Legend and Gilly. Many of you have met. Uh, it is Steve Holiday. Steve, thanks for coming. Hey, good morning. Thank you. Thanks for doing this. You have your own podcast show. Do you want to talk about that? No, let's uh, stay focused. Okay. On here. <laughs> I love it. Okay. Well, Steve, I'll just throw you the question. What's your God story? So earliest memory for me goes back to about age four to five. And by that time, there's already uh, compulsive sexual behavior, uh, meaning masturbation, uh, typically multiple times a day, uh, and elaborate fantasy. Um, I can't remember a time when that wasn't already going on in my head. Uh, basically, as a child, if there wasn't something that occupied my my mind, like I had to be doing something, I resorted to this fantasy world. Uh, and that was characteristic of early years, middle school, high school, uh, that, that continued on through uh, to early adult years. I've been able to put put some pieces of a puzzle together that I didn't have back then because I have no conscious memory, like no concrete memory of a sexual abuse, but all the pieces of the puzzle say that that's the picture on the puzzle. Uh, now, I've been able to uh, put some pieces in in the last six or seven years, um, but let me share the story as it unfolded in my memory, uh, and then we'll get to the, the more recent stuff Um, so as a young child, a lot of shame, just tremendous shame, uh, beliefs about myself. Number one, uh, when God sees me, he's disgusted, uh, even as a young child. Now I had a, a huge desire to please God. I really wanted to be a, uh, my air quotes here, a good kid. Um, and, and looking back, I was, but I, I didn't, that's not how I saw myself. I just saw myself as this dirty, disgusting, you know, little kid. Uh, and another belief, people don't want me around. Uh, I can remember very vividly a moment where I think that probably got reinforced. I don't know that it was the first moment I ever felt it, uh, but I went to a next door neighbor's house. Uh, there was a girl there, my age, a playmate, knocked on the door and her older brother came and opened the door. Now in my memory, I'm a little bitty kid. In my memory, he's this towering, uh, and you're probably older teenager. In reality, he might've been, I don't know, middle school age. Um, but he opens up the door, he looks down at me and he says, go home. We don't want you here and slams the door. So the core belief, nobody wants me it is there in that picture. And so I, I spent a lot of time just isolated, um, and, and living in this fantasy world. Um, we moved around a, a good bit when I was younger. And so the, um, you know, the belief that relationships don't last or people leave don't get in reality. I was the one leaving, Uh, but in the mind of the child, um, nobody's really going to be there for me. And you can buy that with the nobody wants me. And it's, you know, it's pretty clear why a little kid would be so isolated. Yeah. Again, desperately wanting friends. And again, I look back through an adult lens and I recognize I did have some friends in the neighborhoods when we lived in. Um, But as a little kid, 
Uh, I, I never felt like those those friends liked me or wanted me. Uh, and so the the fantasy in my head was always to counterbalance that. Uh, you know, as a, a counselor at this point, uh, with the training that I've had, I recognize a fantasy is typically the mind's attempt to correct a trauma. It's like we live through something and in our reality, it's very painful. And so we create this fantasy world and, and it can be a, a consistent fantasy or it can be a, like a daydream um, that happens. Would you repeat that definition for me? Fantasy a, a fantasy is attempt. often the mind's attempt to correct a trauma. And so oftentimes they're not sexual in nature. Um, you know, one of my early ones was being the kid with the basketball in hand on the court. You know, I'm, I'm on the basketball team and, you know, it's the countdown where we're point behind and the countdown five, four, three, and I throw up the shot and swoosh, it goes in and whoosh, you know, Steve, in that moment, Steve's wanted, Steve's important, Steve matters, people like him. Um, so that's what I mean by in the fantasy, it's a, it's a very different reality than my real reality is. So a lot of my fantasies started off more in that genre, um, but it, it didn't take very long for fantasy to get paired with sexual behavior. And so the content became very romanticized or very sexualized. And it wasn't basketball anymore. Right. Um, now, th those pieces were, you know, were always there um, on some level. But let's say if it started out that that was 90 percent, uh, then certainly by middle school years and beyond, uh, that might have been 9 percent and you know, 90 plus percent on the sexual side. So, you know, Steve grows up, we, we move around uh, middle school and high school years were uh, all in central North Carolina. At that point, my family put down roots and uh, my parents have lived in that central part of North Carolina ever since then. So from sixth grade on, we lived in the same house and I went, you know, the same students went through the same school progress. So probably the next big piece of my story comes in high school. I was 16 years old, went to a summer Bible camp. Now I'd gone to summer Bible camp, probably starting in, I think, third grade in West Virginia. But at this point, it's North Carolina. I go to Bible camp. I really don't know anybody. I didn't go with a church, like with a group from church. Um, I went, I show up. It's just me. Now, I know a few adults uh, just from youth rallies and things in the area. Uh, the first night of Bible camp, I'm in a top bunk. And I wake up at some point. I hadn't been asleep long, so this might have been around midnight. Uh, a storm comes through and massive rain, and there's a hole in the roof above my bunk. And so my sleeping bag is getting more wet and drenched. Um, one of my core beliefs, I don't want to, I don't want to bother anybody. I, I'm a bother. Again, nobody wants me around. I'm a bother. I laid there for the longest time, just paralyzed. I don't even know what to do. Um, I couldn't go back to sleep because it was so wet. Finally, I get the courage to wake up the youth minister who's in the bunk beneath me. Um, and I said, there's a, there's a hole in the roof. There's a leak. My, my sleeping bag's wet. What should I do? He says, well, you can just sleep with me tonight. Now, I'm a naive 16-year-old. I'm not looking for anything but a place to lay down that's dry and go to sleep. Um, obviously, what was in his mind was a completely different scenario. Um, and so he took advantage of an opportunity. And what happened for the next probably 45 minutes should never happen to anybody. Right. But it happened to me. I woke up the next morning and pretended like nothing happened. Um, I sat at that youth minister's table the whole week because that was my assigned seat for the week. Um, didn't know what in the world to do. Just tried to put it out of my mind. Now, and tears start coming up in me as I'm uh, speaking through this. That's okay. Um, starting at age 16, I could not go to sleep at night without my hands placed in a protective position over my groin. Um, Behavior is a voice. Behavior often says things we don't know how to say, or it's not safe for us to say. And whether we're a child or an adult, a lot of times our behavior is a way for us to speak when we really don't know how to, how to put it into words. Well, that behavior screams, don't touch me. Um, and I couldn't go to sleep until I began recovery at age 33. So for 16 plus years, every night, um, my body is, is communicating, hey, something's happened. I don't feel safe. I don't want anybody touching me. Um, again, I, I don't mention that to anybody. That just goes dormant. But in my mind, in my memory, it comes up every day. 
And so I, I'm going through, you know, I'm living with this, this uh, intrusive, painful memory tries to come up in my mind. When it does, I just want to push it down and lock the lid on that box. And when I do, it tries to open the lid of the box and come back up every day of my life till age uh, 33. So by this point, um, you know, I say by this point, let, let's fast forward to college. Um, I'm preparing to be a full-time youth minister. That That's my goal. I knew from the high school I wanted to go into youth ministry. So I'm in school, um, having a good time in school in a, in a good way. Um, I don't take a lot of hours any particular semester. So I end up taking six years to get a four-year degree. Now I did add, you know, I kept adding majors, minors. So I ended up with a double major, double minor. Uh, but I was in the slow route because I just didn't. Um, you weren't in a hurry. I didn't, yeah, I didn't push myself very much. Um, and so during this time, I meet my now wife, Holly. Um, we start dating, and within just a few months, I think we started dating. Um, well, certainly by October. We probably started dating before then, but we were definitely dating by October uh, of 1990. Um, by February, we were officially engaged. And by August of 91, uh, we're married. Uh, and when we speak together, we say we're the poster children for how not to do this. <laughs> um, there was so much unhealthy for me, so much unhealthy for her. Uh, both of us had this enormous baggage of trauma. And neither one of us had any idea how it was affecting us or what to do with it. And I think probably both of us really didn't realize um, what all was there. Uh, if if you had asked me at that time, um, hey, has ever has anything hurtful ever happened? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Um, if you'd asked me, uh, do you have a deep dark sexual secret? Well, if I'd been honest, I would have said yes because I knew I did, but I, I sure didn't know what to do with it. Um, it is amazing to me how capable we are of ignoring ever present trauma. Like you said, we, we we put it in the box and it's trying to come out every day. But the number of people that will say, well, no, that, that that's not really having an effect on me and believe it and mean it. You know, they're not they're lying to themselves, but they don't know they're lying to themselves. They're just not aware of that. That doesn't make sense, but it's almost universal. Mm -hmm. So that, that's not a criticism. It's just one of those things about human nature that amazes me how how our psyche buries, buries things. Yeah. Denial is very effective. Avoidance is very effective. And for me, there was a lot of dissociation. I mean, I, I forevermore was just mentally checked out and unaware. I mean, I would be on autopilot driving. Um, several years into our marriage, we moved to Columbia, South Carolina. I was doing medical sales, and I covered the state of South Carolina and some fringe territories outside the state. But um, I had done summer youth minister internships in Columbia at St. Andrew's Road Church of Christ. So for three years... Every summer, I'm going to St. Andrew's Road Church of Christ multiple times a day. Uh, during those years of medical sales, I couldn't count the number of times I came to sitting in the parking lot at St. Andrew's Road Church of Christ and had no reason to be there. Yeah. I mean, I was, I was out you know, doing medical sales in Columbia that day, and somehow or another, I end up at the church parking lot. Yeah. Um, and I don't know how long I might have been sitting there a minute. I could have been sitting there an hour. I have no idea. Yeah. And did I break traffic laws? I have no idea because there's no memory of it. Yeah. Um, now, that's, you know, that's some pretty strong defense mechanism going on for my brain to totally check out a reality. Yeah. Um, now, as a counselor now, that just screams, as big red flag, that screams trauma at that point in my life. I didn't know what, I, I just thought, man, there's something wrong with me. I, I wouldn't have no, no clue what it was. Well, it's funny because, you know, like uh, checking out a little occasionally is not terribly, I mean, right. you know, everybody has been driving down the interstate and then you kind of look at me, where am I again? You know, have, have I passed Jackson yet? Mm -hmm. But doing it deeply and often deeply is the mm -hmm. word I have. You know, it's funny. There's, there's difference between kind of the typical and. and yeah, I, I daydream. Yeah. Uh, or dissociate to the extent that uh, I don't know where I am and who I am. You know, dissociative fugue would be like the, the end of the spectrum on, on that dissociation. Yeah. Uh, where somebody's walking down the road two hours from home. They don't know who they are, where they live. They're, they're completely checked out. Um, but 
you know, more on the other end of the spectrum, that the less severe is, you know, for five minutes, I'm sitting in a crowd of people listening and their conversation going, and mentally I'm just somewhere else. Yeah. Um, and at some point something happens and gets my attention, and then I'm right back there. That That's not that uncommon right. for people. It's funny, even on, on the fantasy uh, world, like you talked about earlier, I, th- I think it's a really human, normal thing for people to have some daydreams and fantasies. Uh, you know, who hasn't thought what they do when they win the, the lottery? Mm-hmm. I'm getting a helicopter, by the way, uh, depending on which lottery I win, how many helicopters. But, you know, the, there is a degree to which, and one of the things that I appreciate that I, I perceive has happened in the last few years, we have become more aware of how many things are spectrum-based. Mm-hmm. It's not It's not always uh, binary. You have this condition or you don't have this condition. It's everybody has some of this. Mm-hmm. Everybody has ups and downs. That's on a spectrum with with bipolar, manic, depressed. Mm-hmm. It, th- that's the extreme version. And it's okay for me to recognize I might not be all the way over there with the the worst version of this, but mm-hmm. maybe I have enough that I need to be paying attention to it. Mm-hmm. Or maybe well, even when you're listening to this podcast, you think, you know, oh, wow, I do that a lot. Maybe I should talk to somebody about, is this is this a healthy place in the mm-hmm. spectrum? You know, I, I noticed that I do the, the check out while I drive thing in moments where life is stressful. Mm-hmm. Um, and I had not done it probably in years, but uh, a couple of weeks ago I was driving somewhere and I literally, I looked at the GPS because I could not remember how far down the interstate I had mm-hmm. driven. You know, wait, yeah. have, I, have I made it to Burns yet? <laughs> like, yeah. and you know, Nashville to Burns is not a long trip, you know? Um, so I, I just think recognizing the spectrum stuff is is super helpful. But and, and I, I think it's derailing. And, and, well, and that's, that's uh, giving us information. Hey, it says our brain is basically on overload. And it's looking for a way to find some relief. It's load so, shedding. It's it's rolling blackouts of the brain. Mm-hmm. Um, you mentioned the the continuum. You know, because I would argue every family has dysfunction. Yeah. You know, now some families are more severely dysfunctional than others, but there are no perfect families. There are no perfect people. There are no perfect parents. Yeah. Um, and and we're all somewhere in there. Um, so I, I just recognize that Holly and I, when when we first met. We were pretty extreme on the, we, we've had some severe trauma uh, and pretty dysfunctional, but didn't realize it. And so when we got together, uh, our my, my dysfunction was attracted by hers and hers, mine. It's like this invisible uh, sign. I'm convinced we all have invisible neon signs above our head. And subconsciously, we, we read what's on other people's signs. Yeah. Uh, and we're drawn to that. You know, my years, years of youth ministry... Uh, I could take my youth group to a big youth rally. Um, the most wounded, broken student in my group is going to run into the most wounded, broken student in some other group, and they're going to connect, and they're going to be either best friends or they're going to have a, a, a weekend romance uh, and feel like they've known each other forever. Um, it just it, it just happens. It's almost funny to watch when you're in youth mm-hmm. ministry, too, you know, because you see it coming a mile away. So that, that was, you know, Holly and I... Um, Met, got married, and it went from um, difficult to terrible really fast. Okay. Uh, within the first few weeks, it was already bad. And for eight years, it was just, it was terrible. Uh, again, that's because both of us were, were so dysfunctional as individuals. Uh, we, we There's no way we were going to have a healthy relationship. Um, and it wasn't, you know, we weren't having, you know, uh, massive fights. There was no physical violence. Um, there were definitely uh, fits of rage. Um, there were moments where uh, we're not talking because Steve is in his little turtle shell. Uh, you know, Holly is more natural. Let's let's just deal with whatever the issue is and then we're done with it. And I am more natural. What issue? There's no issue. Um, I'm just going to hide for days or weeks and not talk about anything. And so uh, eventually it came to a, a head for us in uh, the fall of 1999. By this point, we had four kids, and uh, I'm a full-time youth minister in North Carolina, and we're standing on the back steps up to our uh, living room. Inside the living room are the four kids. We're outside for having a conversation. And Holly basically says, I don't know how long you want to keep doing this, but I'm done. Um I've heard somebody on the, she is saying, I, I heard somebody on the radio. I think he might be able to help us. 
Uh, if you want to make an appointment with him, you're welcome to do so. But I'm done. So long story short, I make an appointment with a guy. Uh, we drive two and a half hours, have an hour session, drive two and a half hours back. Holly says if we'd had two vehicles, we'd have driven separately. <laughs> um, we didn't, so we were stuck together. And it, this happened for a, about you know seven to eight trips uh, before things started actually improving. But uh, somewhere um, on on the way home, around trip number eight, uh, early on in the trip, she asked me a question, and it took me a while, but I finally was able to respond. Now, for me, um, Holly would ask questions. I would get so trapped in my head of playing out, well, if I say this, she's going to react this way. But if I say this, then she's going to... And so I get so stuck in trying to play out, is there anything I can say that feels safe? Um, like, I could say this and she won't be mad, or she won't be disappointed, or I won't feel shame, or... Um, it would go on so long, she would just give up and walk away. And understandably so. I mean, you ask a question and for five minutes, nobody responds. It's understandably to be frustrated by that. Yeah. Oh, but trapped in the car, I had long enough. I, I came up with some response and that began a conversation that was painful and slow. You know, it was elaborate in, in just how it took place. Um, but that got us started on being able to talk through some pretty painful things. Um, and things started getting better. I think we continued the marriage counseling for about six months. Things got a lot better. Now, neither of us had dealt with our own stuff, but at least we were uh, getting to a point where I think we were understanding each other better uh, and working through some things from you know eight years of a lot of hurt. About a year later, uh, Holly began her journey on dealing with her um, years of sexual abuse in a um, in a dating relationship from age 14 to 17. About a year after that, I ran across a place in Nashville called Bethesda Workshops, uh, which is Christ-centered treatment for sexual addiction. Uh, at that time, I had never put myself under the sexual addiction umbrella. I'd always looked at it as, man, I really struggle with lust. Uh, I knew I've got huge secrets. Um, and I, as I mentioned, when we started earliest memories, it's already there. The compulsive sexual behavior, the fantasy, it's already there. Uh, over time, it had morphed into uh, a lot of renting B-rated movies. When I say B-rated, not X-rated movies. They were not movies that were meant to come out on the big screen. They're low budget excuses for sexual content. Yeah. Um, again, not hardcore gr content. You know, what you would typically seen an R-rated movie, yeah, uh, but a really low-budget R-rated movie. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so I, I would, you know, typically, if Holly was going to be out of town, you know, it started before we got married. It started in college. So if my roommate was going to be out of town, I'd go to the video store. Now, here's the insanity of it. I'd go to the video store, and I'd rent three or four videos. I'd go back to the dorm. I'd fast-forward through one uh, to a scene that I wanted to see. I would have my moment of pleasure, and then I would be so consumed with guilt and shame, I would take the whole stack back in less than an hour. Yeah. Now, I always wondered, the guy behind the counter, what in the world is he thinking? Like, this guy came and rented four movies, and an hour later, he brings all four of them back? Yeah. Now, here's the insanity part. The next day, I would go back, I would rent some of those same movies. Yeah. Because I had enough time for the guilt to, to come down. Home. Right. Um, now, from a logic standpoint, that's obviously insanity. But that was, that was the world I lived in. Um, and so that, you know, that just continued on and, and escalated in frequency over the years. Uh, but that was, that was basically what my life was. You know, I, I lived this secret component um, filled with shame. Uh, and, you know, the, the God is so disgusted by me. God is so disappointed in me. Um, and yet I'm trying so hard to be pleasing to God. My heart wants to do the right thing, but I don't know how not to not do the wrong thing. Yeah. Um, you know, it sounds very similar like Romans 7, right? It's like, um, I know I'm not the only person who ever experienced that. Uh, I've come to find out a lot of people live that cycle. I think the only people who don't live that cycle are the people who are so deep into denial that they don't, they don't know they're just, you know. Uh, but but that was that was my world inside my head, um, 
And so when I ran across Bethesda workshops, um, that, let me give okay, because it is kind of funny. So let me, let me give you the, the larger version of the story. Um, by that point, I, I knew I wanted to continue my education and do counseling, like be a counselor. But I, I needed to do some counseling, all right, but yeah. not as the counselor. Both um, sides of the task. So I'd been to a couple of um, Christian counseling conventions and just, you know, just to start to get introduced to what would this be like. Um, so it was on my radar to go back to school. Uh, and by the spring of 2002, I'd actually registered for an online program through Liberty University. Um, I got the, the videos, watched the first video started reading the first book. I Somewhere around page four or five, I ran across that to be a good counselor, you have to work through your own issues so that you can be a more effective counselor. I literally closed the book, put it on the shelf in my office, and dropped the class. Yeah. Now, logically, I had no understanding of why I did that. Yeah. I just, I just did. I'm done. Mm-hmm. Um. So within a couple of months of the, I closed the book and dropped the class, I run across across Bethesda workshops. Um, I see that they have a therapist observer option for their workshop. I thought, wow, I could go, because I want to be a counselor one day, I could go and actually just watch the workshop um, because what I'd learned on their website just absolutely interested me. Now, still, I haven't put myself in the, sex addict category. But there's obviously a, a, some subconscious invisible force that has really drawn my attention to this thing. So I call, I talk to the director, Marnie Faree. Uh, full disclosure, Marnie is now on the Ultimate Escape board, but at that time I I'd never, you know, uh, didn't know her. I think I may have been to one of her presentations at a conference at, at some point. Um, but I call, I said, hey, I noticed that the therapist observer option, um, could I do that? And she said, well, are you a counselor? No, but I, I want to be one day. She said, well, and she was very gracious. Um, I cannot imagine what was going through her mind at that time. Yeah. Um, well, I, I can't. I can't imagine what she was probably uh, suspecting. Uh, but she says, you know, Steve, typically therapist observer role is reserved for people who are actually therapists. But if that's something you're interested in at some point, give me a call and we can talk more about it. End of conversation. Within minutes, because I'm still on the website in my office, yeah. uh, I, I run across this self-test. It's called the um, Sex Addiction Screening Tool, the SAST. And so I start taking it. And I think at the, at the time, the SAST was maybe 25, 30 questions. Um, well, after number seven or eight, all of mine had been yes. And it start, but it's like the light bulb finally goes on. Click. Um, oh, this is this thing I've lived with literally almost all of my life. Um, by the time I finished the test, my score is on the top of the chart. I think there were two or three I said no to. Everything else was a perfect fit. Congratulations yeah. on a high score. Hey, you know, great test to have a high score. Um, I, I immediately called back and I said, I need to register for this workshop. Now, again, I, um, Marnie was really gracious. Uh, she, she could have said a lot of other things and, and she didn't. Yeah. Um, so I register, I go, Holly thinks I'm going as a therapist observer. Yeah. Now I have no memory of any conversation with Holly about that. Um, so any, any awareness of that, of whatever would have to be, you know, Holly would have to speak to that. I've got yeah. no memory. I've got no memory of a lot of things in my life. Um, pretty much everything before age 33, before April of 2002, it's questionable whether I would remember it at all. Yeah. Um, so I go to the, the the workshop, and it's like everything makes sense, um, and I'm not the only one because that was one of my beliefs. There's nobody on the planet who thinks the kind of things I think. Yeah. Well, come to find out, I was sitting in a room full of at least 29 other ones who thought the same things that I did. Yeah. Um, in my small group, when we finished sharing our stories, and then there were a couple of things in my story that I I, I certainly didn't want to talk about. I didn't want to talk about uh, the, whatever had happened way back at age four. Um, again, I, I, I've always known there's something back there. I just have no distinct memory of it. Uh, but there were behaviors 
that were in my world as a small child. And I didn't want to talk about that. Um, and I sure didn't want to talk about age 16 at that Bible camp. Right. But I did. And I, I talked about both of those things as I was sharing my story in that small group. When it, when my time was over, the guys in my group looked at me and said, well, why are you here? I thought, I, I just shared my story. Why are you asking me what? It's like, your stuff is so tame compared to all everybody else's story. I mean, everybody else's, you know, multiple affairs and, um, you know, for some of them, illegal activity. And, you know, my story is fantasy and compulsive masturbation and some pretty soft core oriented sexual stuff, yeah. you, know, that, you know, videos and porn. Um, so did, did getting asked that question trigger those core memories of, I don't belong, you don't want me here or was it? No, it was, it was really more of a, uh, wow, I'm not as I'm not crazy. dirty and bad and disgusting as I thought that I was. That's kind of, cool. um, which, yeah, which was, a, it was a very positive, um, I'm not the worst lit, lit mistake. Yeah. It was, yeah. It, it, it's, it's not as bad as I thought it was. Yeah. Now I'm, I'm not in any way minimizing Okay, for those who are listening and, and you're hearing it, all of this through a spiritual lens, I mean, no way meaning to minimize the sinfulness of it. There's nobody on the planet more convicted of the sinfulness of it than I was. Um, so I, I, don't need phone, I don't need phone calls or emails saying that, yeah. uh, that I get how sinful it was. No, and but, we're not saying that a little molestation is better than a lot. Right. But... A little, well, I mean, a little is better than a lot, but neither is okay, right. you know? Yeah, yeah, but we're not, we're not playing those games. No. We're good. Um, but, you know, for me in that moment to recognize I'm not as awful as I've always thought that I was, was a healing, healing moment. Um, so I come back from the workshop, um, disclose to Holly, this is where I've been, and these are the parts about me that you've never known. And it was very difficult for her to hear. So she didn't know about 16. She didn't. I, I, I don't think so, because I don't remember telling anybody exactly what had happened. There were two people during those 16, 17 years that I gave like a hint. Okay, one was a professor at college when I said something about I had been sexually abused, and he acted as though I didn't say it. He didn't acknowledge that I said it. He just move the conversation elsewhere. Okay, that that sent a huge message to yeah, me. We don't, that we don't talk about that. Right. Yeah. Um, and the other uh, was much earlier. I had um, alluded to what had happened to a family member and they basically said, oh, that's gross and then kept on going. Again, they, they didn't know what to do with that any more than I did. Um, and so the, the two times I had just barely put my foot in the water, it got shut down. So no, I, 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 as far as I remember, I'd never mentioned anything about that what, to Holly. What are the rates of sexual abuse? Do you know, isn't it like one in statistics are across the board, and a lot of it depends on how you define it. Because research that goes into definition of sexual abuse is um, basically penetrating behavior. Okay, that's going to be a smaller, smaller percentage. If you widen it to what I believe is a reasonable definition, any unwanted touch, unwanted exposure to content, unwanted comments. Mm -hmm. Basically, it's a sexual moment that is unwanted yeah. by somebody. Um, to stab in the dark, I don't know. Um, 80%, to 90% females. Mm -hmm. by, by the time a female is age 18, uh, I've seen statistics, one out of, uh, one out of, I don't know, I think three out of five Girls by age 18 or by the time they graduate from high school have been sexually abused. Um, in just working with people and, and audiences and, and hearing conversation, especially listening to conversation between women back when Me Too was at its height, yeah. I, I think you'd be hard pressed to find a female who has not experienced an unwanted sexual contact, exposure, something. Yeah. Um, and for guys, I think it's probably more than not, especially 30 and under. You mm -hmm. take the, the, the today's group that's grown up with online porn and cell phones and cell phone cameras from the time they were little. I think you'd, it'd be harder to find somebody who hasn't experienced that than it is to find somebody who has. 
you know, I was just reading a story about the rise of sextortion, mm-hmm. where um, there was a, a case in Tennessee that resulted in a suicide of a young man gets um, naked pictures from a girl. Now, the girl turned out to be three Nigerian guys, but you don't find mm-hmm. that out until it's too late. And she says, why don't you send me yours? So he sends his because he's all excited and he thinks this sounds like fun. And then she replies with, send me $1,000 in Bitcoin or I'm going to send this to your church, your school, your teachers. I'll ruin you. And he says, I'm going to kill myself if you do it. And the person responded with, do it quick. Mm-hmm. So they did. Mm-hmm. Uh you know, I've been trying to tell that story as often as I can since I've heard it because I want people to know this. Um, I want people to know this. And the reason I asked you, I know I just derailed your story just a little bit by asking the question about stats. Mm-hmm. Your experience was I told someone and they acted like this doesn't happen and can't be discussed. Mm-hmm. But what you just did was you said the reality is more people than not have experienced this. Mm-hmm. So maybe the takeaway for this little part of our conversation is let's stop pretending. Sorry, I just started so preaching. If, if you did just your average at any church mm-hmm. on any Sunday morning, just give a random Sunday morning, more people sitting in those pews have experienced sexual trauma, so some some type of sexual abuse, than the ones who haven't. If, if that gives us a chance to stop, okay, that's just the, the context of what people in our pews have experienced. Um probably changes when we recognize that that one variable right there. Mm. You know, the number that that surprised me in ministry in the last decade, the more stories I heard, um, just full disclosure, I, that is not something I experienced. That is not something that the Leslie has experienced. And we've talked about that because of the number of people who have shared their stories. And mm-hmm. it's just, it's almost overwhelming. And Steve, I, I wasn't sure what you were going to talk about today. I, I suspected because mm-hmm. I know the trajectory of what you do that this was the story yeah. you would tell. I was hoping this was the story you would tell because this is, I don't know, probably our 40 something episode of this podcast. We've talked a lot of stories, but not one of these stories. Mm-hmm. And I know mm-hmm. that in the 40 ish people we've talked to, if your stats yeah, are right, statistically, yeah. this is a story behind the story in 20 or 30 of those. Mm-hmm. So, you know, one of the reasons we're doing this podcast is every story is worth telling. And if we don't start telling the truth about our stories, we can't help each other. We can't do better. If you don't turn the lights on, it's always going to be dark. Mm-hmm. And you're shining some light. Thank you. Uh, so so keep going. Sorry, I keep interrupting you. So I get back from Bethesda, uh, share with Holly. Now, if Holly were here uh, at this point, she typically would say uh, what she heard was hard to hear. Mm-hmm. But it was like it was the missing piece. Things had gotten so much better in our marriage Um following the counseling we did early in 2000. Um, it, it was so much better than we ever thought it could be that she was just at that point, it, it was okay in her mind to not know whatever the missing thing that she knew was missing. Um, but at this point, she had the missing piece. Uh, and once we were able to work through over the next several months, uh, just the, the shock that I threw at her um, in beginning my recovery, Things got really good. I mean, our marriage at that point, our, you know, by by late 2002, our marriage was so much better than we ever dreamed it could be. Uh, it, it was just, I mean, you know, and certainly not perfect. Um, and here we are, you know, in 2023, our marriage is still not perfect, but it's way better than we ever dreamed and probably way better than most people experience in their marriage. Um, and that is nothing but a God, God redeeming a lot of brokenness to go from two so dysfunctional individuals when we first met to at least more reasonably functioning at this point. Again, See, ne- neither of us has, has arrived and is perfect. Now you put but, the fun in dysfunctional, you know, <laughs> but uh, it, we, we at least uh, catch our stuff quicker when it happens. Mm-hmm. Um, and what might have at one point been a, it took Steve two weeks to come out of the turtle show now it might take an hour. Yeah. Um, that, that's a lot that's better. progress. Yes, that's a lot better. Um, so two years after uh, I went to Bethesda, uh, you know, I, I, two years of ministry, and, and, I, and I grew as a youth minister because I was, that was functioning way better just inside my head. Well, now you're aware of some things that have affected half of your people too. And um, I, I started doing some calculating 
just the teenagers, the, the, the high school juniors and high school seniors in my group. And my group uh, on, on roll would have been about 70 middle school, high school, actual participants closer to 50. Right. Uh, but of that 50 middle school, high school students, um, the juniors and seniors, I knew because they had come and talked to me. I knew that 70% were dealing with some kind of sexual issue, whether somebody had sexually hurt them or they couldn't stop looking at porn. Uh, they were doing sexual things with their boyfriend or girlfriend and felt bad about it and wanted to fix it. Uh, I knew 70% of our our group in that last two years of high school was dealing with that. I couldn't find any place that was designed, again, this back in 2002, couldn't find any place where... Um, teens who were struggling with addictive sexual behavior could get help. So I was on the phone with everybody I knew from my own recovery, um, counselors. I, I called Abilene Christian. Um, seems like there was one other organization I called, and uh, everybody was telling me the same thing. And this is leaders in the field of sexual addiction. Nobody is doing that with teenagers. So that that put on my radar, well, somebody needs to be doing this with teenagers. Um, At the same time, our church was going through the Rick Warren's Purpose Driven Life book. I think every church under the under the sun was in in 0203 was doing the 40 Days of Purpose campaign. I I saw so many churches with a big banner out, and and we were too. Yeah. So my prayer during that time was, God, if there's something you've prepared me to do, like you 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 have designed me to accomplish X, Y, or Z. If there's anything besides what I'm doing right now, help me see it. And then here was the tag on my prayer, but I really love being a youth minister and I really love the church I'm at. It's Friendly Avenue Church of Christ in Greensboro, North Carolina. I've been there six years. It was just like the perfect fit for me and my family. Yeah. You, you couldn't have gotten a better, I mean, you know, one of the biggest blessings in ministry is to be at the place that is a good fit. Yeah. And, and that's where we were. Uh, but that was my prayer. And within a couple of weeks, the vision for what became Ultimate Escape developed. So I went to the elders and I said, this is what I believe God has prepared me to do. But to do it, I need to do some counseling training. They said, give us some time and let us see if if there's a way that that can happen and you still serve as our youth minister. I thought, man, that'd that'd be great because, again, I don't want to leave where I'm at. Yeah. But I definitely want to do whatever God has prepared me to do. Right. Um, well, over the next several weeks, Holly and I eventually ended up in a conversation one Friday in our front yard, uh, and we both felt like the Holy Spirit was leading us to just take the step of faith and and do it without having the answer to how's it, how's it going to happen. Yeah. Well, by the end of that conversation, we both felt very convicted. Okay, it would be disobedient to not do. I mean, that's how strong we felt this was. This wasn't just a leaning. It was a, this is yeah. where I have to go. And so um, Saturday night, I sit down and I type out my letter of resignation. And I mean, I'm boohooing. Yeah. I mean, there, there are tears dropping on my keyboard as I'm typing. Uh, I hand it to one of the elders at church the next day. Um, they're sad to receive it, but extremely supportive of what I'm trying to do. Yeah. Um, and so the the church was very helpful in in the the planting the seed uh, of getting me where I need to be Regent University, um, giving us a, a good bit of support to help us just get out the door and get started. Um, and so for the next two years, I worked on my degree in counseling. I started doing some extra training in the area of sexuality, um, and eventually, uh, my my specific training has been around sexual trauma. Uh, the, the largest amount of training I've done is around sexual trauma, uh, but also around addictive sexual behavior and sexual identity. And those are the three areas that I primarily work with. Um, at this point, here we are, I got started counseling in 2006. This is 2023, so 17 years in the counseling chair. And at this point, probably 90% of the people I work with are sexual trauma survivors. Uh, most of those female uh, but I come to typically when there's a guy who's struggling with porn, we run across there's with some early exposure. And whether it was at age six, something happened or um, they were exposed to porn early childhood, there, there typically is some kind of traumatic sexual event yeah. back there that puts them on that 
path. Um, most people don't get addicted to porn out of nowhere. Right. Uh, it, it comes from from some kind of exposure. I mean, no. you started us with shame, loneliness, isolation, all of those mm-hmm. things. Uh, and you know, I mean, porn is a a relief, albeit temporary. But you know, when somebody's looking at porn, the lonely, the I feel terrible about myself, all that's gone. Uh, and there's a massive dopamine dump, uh, uh, and it, it feels really good. You now, two minutes after, I'm right back to I feel horrible about what I just did. Even worse. Yeah. Like, yeah, now it's another layer of I feel bad. Um, but um, you know, in the last, uh, officially on paper, Ultimate Escape as a corporation started March of 05. Okay. Uh, we began the ministry when we left Friendly Avenue in the fall of 04 when I started graduate school. But officially on paper, March of 05. And I honestly thought I might speak in a couple different states. I mean, I thought, I'll, I'll go to graduate school, move back to North Carolina. I might speak. You know, in a few states around North Carolina, that was my vision for the ministry. And God has absolutely blown the doors off of my little vision for what I thought the ministry would be. Uh, I've been very fortunate. Um, we've spoken in uh, about half, a little bit over half of the states in, in the United States of America. I think it's been nine or 10 different countries on four different continents. How cool. Um, and God has just opened doors. Yeah. And what I found is that people are people. And it doesn't matter what language, doesn't matter what country, um, people experience broken sexuality and struggle with sexual stuff. And just the, the the stories are a little bit different. The faces are different. The language might be different. But at the core, it's the same thing. People are people. Yeah. We, we use a broken version of sexuality to try to compensate for the hurts that, that, that are inside. And let's go here for just a second. Um Sexuality is not a topic that our society talks about well. Not, mean, not a healthy way, right? Right. It gets yeah. talked about, but almost never, you know, sex is in terms of conquests. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, there's a lot of weird sexism that goes into our sexuality. We we slut shame women, but guys are heroes. Uh, you know, there's these double standards that exist. You know, the girl gets pregnant. She gets a scarlet A. The guy gets ignored. Um, and then the church, sometimes well-intended, uh, you know, I, I grew up in the era where we did a lot of the purity culture stuff mm-hmm. where we talked about sexual purity, which I appreciate. But the messaging we got was if you commit a sexual sin, you are now broken. You're a you're a flower that no one will ever want. And so uh, we did some extreme stuff where we made it where girls and boys could never look at each other and everything was girls fault. Mm-hmm. And, you know, there's been so there's these wild pendulum swings yeah. where there was the teaching of you should never kiss a girl. Um, and today it's, well, I could think of a version or two of that, but none of them I'm real comfortable saying out loud. And you know, uh, uh, that our kids in high school are probably more comfortable performing sex acts on each other than they are mm-hmm. kissing each other. Mm-hmm. That That's the way the pendulum has swung and it will go, it will go another direction in another few years. And now we're in a place culturally where, you know, uh, we don't know what to do with, there's so much that is politicized mm-hmm. about some of these conversations. Right. There are certain sexual issues that are so heavily stigmatized that we make them out to be unredeemable sins. Mm-hmm. And there's ent- So, you know, we have opened ourselves to the charge of homophobia because sometimes we have been, mm-hmm. um, not always, but some, it, this is just a hot mess. Yes. So, well, I just did two minutes of yeah. rambling about a problem. You have been investing a lot in solutions. We've been knocking on doors since 2005. And 96, 97% of those knocks get the door slammed back. Mm. Um, so I, if I get to go somewhere and speak, um, almost unanimous, it's thank you so much. We We really need to hear this. The people in the pews are desperate. Parents are desperate. Parents of toddlers. We, we see the world our kids are growing up in. What, what, how in the world do we protect them? What do we do? Parents of teens, our kids are right in the thick of it. What do we do? Um, grandparents are so concerned about what their kids, their grandchildren are seeing. People in the pews are starving for being equipped to deal with this. 
and it continues to be that by and large church leadership is thinking, well, people don't want to talk about this. People are going to get mad if, if we address this topic. Uh, it's way better now than it was 10 years ago. But, but when I started, it's, it's like if I had done it for free, we, we, you couldn't get a church to agree to have Ultimate Escape come in and do presentations. Uh, at least at this point, um, it, it is not that difficult. To, it's not as difficult as it used to be. Um, but we've got a track record for you know, all these years of if we go somewhere, it goes really well. Yeah. And people are, are helped and people appreciate the information. That helps because I know that you're not scary. Still hard yeah. to get churches to open up and talk about things. I, I I typically say there are two places in our culture you can go and not hear anything about sex. Home and church. Yeah. You're not Everywhere home. else, it's in your face in a very broken, confusing way. Um home and church should be the two places we are hearing about it in a healthy way. Uh, but it's so difficult to get churches to address something that, as you said, it, it's huge in our culture. But like we're paralyzed out of fear of how will people react. You know, the, the only education most people get, maybe they got a class in school, and if they did, it was lousy. I've never, ever heard of someone saying it was particularly useful mm -hmm. or taught me healthy, much less Christian right. healthy. You know, usually it's here's how to not get pregnant at best, mm -hmm. right? Um, I don't know that that message is there anymore. It used to be. Yeah. No. You know, um, there's there's one source. The other source is the locker room. And God knows mm -hmm. that's not an accurate, right. healthy version. Or if people are getting it at home, a lot of times they're getting it from people who got it unhealthily the first time. Their their parents who have trauma who never dealt with right. it are afraid to talk about it. So the kids learn from the silence of the sickness mm -hmm. and the shame and the we don't talk Absolutely. about the turtle shell stuff. So you know the, the church look in in the book of I love to use this line in the book of Leviticus Moses by God gave the people instructions about where to bury their poop mm -hmm. and what to do with mildewy tents. Okay, uh, he told them what to do with nocturnal emissions. Mm -hmm. Uh, so if that's in the Bible, we have a pretty wide latitude to say that the church is a place where you should be educated for living well. Right. That's what the book of Proverbs is. So yeah, our, our preaching needs to be primarily gospel. I need to talk to you about Jesus, but I also need to talk to you about your kid and the smartphone mm -hmm. and the app that they should not have. Uh, you know, absolutely. I can't make some of those things conditions of faith because they're the world of, of practicality, but they need to hear that from us. Yeah. Because if they don't hear it from us, I don't like who they're going to hear it from. I was speaking at AIM Adventures and Missions in Lubbock just a couple of days ago. Um, on the beginning of day two, before I start speaking, there's a guy who's leading a prayer, one of the students. He, he looks to be about 18 years old. Um, and in his prayer, uh, he's thanking God for the information that has been presented over the weekend so far. And then he says, it would have been really good to have heard this before now. Huh. And he says, and people all over the world would be better off if they heard this information. And I so appreciated the mindset that he was speaking from. Um, I continue to be impressed by when I speak to a university group um, or to a group like AIM, that this is just out of high school. Um, there is an anger that surfaces among the students at the fact that their church didn't talk about this stuff. Young people, college age people are angry that churches refuse to address in a healthy way the topic of sexuality. And they have a right to be. That, that is a fair thing to resent. It stinks that it seems like the only churches that have talked about it have talked about it in unhealthy ways. You know, don't. It's wrong. You're going to go to hell if yep. if you do that. And again, in more recent years, more and more churches are starting to be able to have a conversation. What I'm speaking to is with a very broad brush. Of course. Historically, as, as the body of Christ, historically, we have not done a good job addressing the area of sexuality. Okay, I have one more question for you if you got time for it. 
Tell me about chocolate bunnies. You can learn a lot about sex from a chocolate bunny. Yeah? Have me come speak on the theology of sex. And the question of how do you learn about sex from a chocolate bunny is going to be answered. That's, uh, I think, Steve's kind of hallmark talk that he gives. Uh, and I think you you want to hear about that because what I appreciate is, um, Steve, you speak with honest words. You know, you don't use all these goofy euphemisms that make make things difficult, mm-hmm. but also you can learn from a chocolate bunny. We try to make it fun because it's such a sensitive topic. Yeah. Uh, and just talking about sex triggers people's baggage. Uh, there's no way we're going to have a presentation about sexuality that people listening aren't triggered into whatever their background is. If somebody did something to them, if they made choices that they regret, whatever that is. Uh, so we try to have some lighthearted, um, you know, very respectful, but still lighthearted moments in the presentation where we come up and I also find that uh, when people see something, they remember it much better. Absolutely. So next Easter, when there's a chocolate bunny, somebody's going to remember, hey, you can learn a lot about sex from that right there. Uh, and a host of other object lessons that we do with Ultimate Escape. But our, our goal is to make it comfortable and memorable, but talk about the deep stuff that we need to talk about. Where can people go to find out more or to get help or to learn more about your ministry? So our, our best resource, I would say, is our podcast. Um, it's just it's called Ultimate Escape, and it's available on most of the major podcast outlets. You know, so um, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, um, wherever you whatever you, whatever your normal podcasts are, um, we're available there. Uh, there's also information on our website, um, but I would say the the best resource is start listening to the podcasts. Fantastic. Well, Steve, thank you for um, um, kind of pulling back the curtain. We went to some deep places, some tough places. You're welcome. Thanks for the opportunity. I hope we didn't traumatize your children too much, but uh, I would rather traumatize them this way than not, uh, because this is some conversation that just needs to happen. Well, friends, thank you so much for listening today. Thank you for always believing in the power of God to redeem the things that go wrong in our life to bring better for the next generation. That's one of our commitments is how can we take uh, what's happened to us and not waste it, but use it for for something good. God is so good in the way that he he takes yuck and turns it into something that helps others. Thanks for listening. I hope that you'll share this with a friend. And until next time, I think God is going to do some pretty cool things in your story. Thanks for listening to Rough Drafts. Be sure to subscribe so you don't miss a single episode. While you're at it, help us spread the word by leaving a rating and review. Until next time, let's keep looking for how God writes his love into our stories.